Welcome back to the Timmer Podcast, a show where you and I investigate the life, conquests, character, and legacy of Amir Timmer. Thank you for being patient with me during this two-week interlude. I appreciate your support, and I am thrilled to be back at it. So let's begin. When we last left off, Timur and Hussein were leading their diverse army to liberate the region of Transoxiana from the occupying Mughals. And I say the army was diverse because it included Hussein's Afghan warriors, allied hillmen from Badakhshan, Persian spearmen hired as mercenaries or maybe simple adventurers, hordes of horsemen from all tribes of Transoxiana, including quite a few from Timur's own Barlas tribe, and scores of other people as well. But all of these people were united for two reasons. First of all, an oppressive occupying foe has this amazing ability to unite previous enemies together. In this case, the Mughals had ruled with an iron fist, and the people had had enough. And secondly, Timur and Hussein were ideal leaders to rally behind for such an offensive. Both had personally suffered at the hands of the Mughals, both had lost land and friends to Mughal arrows, and both had a score to settle with the Mughals. Thus, as we saw in the past few episodes, Timur and Hussein led this makeshift force into Transluxiana after crossing the Amu Darya River. Here they engaged with various scouts and allied forces of the Mughals, and though the, the fighting had been fierce, Timur and Hussein emerged victorious and were able to make their way further into the heartland of this country. Then, using the old trick of kicking up a ton of dust to make the enemy think you're more numerous than you actually are, Timur tricked the Mughal garrison to leave the city of Kesh, which gave Timur and Hussein this new headquarters to continue their reconquest. This was also an added bonus for Timur, as Kesh had been his home city, and it was here that he had hosts of loyal followers and tribesmen who had followed him before and were eager to do so again now. And this is where we left off with the story two weeks ago. But before we continue, I want to point something out to you. As we've seen, Timur and Hussein have been close allies, brothers-in-law, and possibly even friends for some time now. They've suffered, been defeated, been imprisoned, and fought in this, this storm of battle together. And they really need each other right now more than ever. For Hussein, while he commands the majority of the troops, and he has the best claim to leadership, and he has experience running a kingdom before, He's not from northern Transoxiana. He doesn't have this intimate knowledge of the tribes and the cities and the people here. Some people even view him as this complete outsider. Thus, he needs Timur because Timur grew up here. Everybody knows the Barlas tribe, and likely many have at least heard of Timur or maybe his uncle or father. In contrast, while Timur does have his recognizable name and heritage, he doesn't have nearly enough power. Hell, even allied with Hussein, Timur probably still doesn't have enough power. And yes, he does have much of the Barlas tribe, and now the city of Kesh, and several allied tribes behind him, but that's not enough. Timur needs the manpower and prestige that Hussein brings to the table. Okay, with that cleared up, here's what I want you to watch for. As you know, Timur will go on eventually to create an empire called the Timurid Empire or Timurid Empire. And notice how it's not called the Timurid and Husseinian Empire. You and I know what's coming. At some point, somehow or another, this friendship and alliance between Timur and Hussein is going to come to an end. There can only be one. And what's likely is that you know this, I know this, and also Timur and Hussein knew this too. So as we continue, let's pay special attention to Timur and Hussein's relationship. Because so far it's been pretty good, but this isn't going to always be the case. So that's just something to keep in mind, but anyway, getting back to the situation here in Transoxiana, or Transoxania, or Mawarnar, you can call it any one of those names. Uh, I've been calling it Transoxiana, so we'll go with that. It's about the year 1364 or 1365, and again, the events in the years between, say, 1362 and 1365 happen at different times depending on what, what source you're reading, but for the sake of our sanity, let's say the year is about late 1364. Timur and Hussein have just taken the city of Kesh, but they aren't the only ones who are preparing for this inevitable showdown. 
If you'll remember, the leader of the Mughals is a man named Khan Tughlaq Timur, and he is currently in the east in Mughalistan putting down various rebellions there. But because he didn't want to lose control of his recently conquered province of Transoxiana, he had left his son, Ilyas Hoja, there with a sizable army to keep the peace. And Ilyas was not about to sit idly by while Timur and Hussein are invading. We're told that when Timur and Hussein took the city of Kesh, Ilyas was gathering his forces only about four leagues away. Which, for those of you who, like me, has no idea what that means, it's about 14 miles or 22 and a half kilometers away. And Ilyas's army, by all accounts, was far larger than that of Timur and Hussein's. But at this point, there's no turning back for either side. The die has been cast. In the days before this inevitable battle, Timur and Hussein continue to rush about the land, especially the city of Kesh, hurriedly gathering whomever they can to join them, and we're told that actually quite a few new followers do ally with them. The taking of Kesh was no small task. This showed the people of Transoxiana that just maybe there was hope for defeating the Mughals. We're also told that at this time, Timur and Hussein went to a holy location, probably the grave of an influential Islamic teacher, and here they swore allegiance to one another and to the independence of Transoxiana. They needed one another more than ever. The next few days, as the two armies began maneuvering towards one another, and as the scouts of both began to circle the other opposing force, Timur and Hussein's army began to grow a bit nervous. The Mughals not only outnumbered them greatly, but was also more of a professional army in many regards. This alliance of Timur and Hussein's men was a whole mix of all sorts of people with different stories and languages and many who had no doubt ever been in a battle. But this is when, as we're told, divinity overlapped with history. And I'm just realizing now that there's like 17 sparrows right outside my window and they're all tweeting for some stupid nature reason, I don't know. I'm sorry about that, there's nothing I can do that's legal about this, so just try to ignore the sparrows like I will. But okay, let's get back to this. According to the sources, the night before the battle, as Timur slept, he was visited in a dream by some messenger from God. And this messenger told Timur, Fear nothing, for the Most High God will graciously give thee the victory. So the next morning, when Timur woke up, he asked if anybody had spoken to him during his sleep, and they told him no, so Timur concluded that this was indeed a message from God. Now, before we jump into an argument of whether or not this truthfully happened, bear with me for a moment. I'm going to tell you a real quick personal story from my college years, which happened ever so long ago. In one of my history classes, a friend and I were debating. We had been covering the First Crusade in the class, and if you don't know the story of the First Crusade, let me just tell you that it is an absolutely insane story in every way. But perhaps the most insane thing about it is that it actually worked. Nearly every other crusade would be a failure, and in some cases a huge and bloody failure, but somehow the First Crusade achieved its goals. Anyway, one of the most pivotal moments in the First Crusade is when the Crusaders arrive and then subsequently besiege the city of Antioch, which is in modern-day Syria near the coast of the Mediterranean. And the story of the siege is long and brutal, but eventually the Crusaders ma manage to take the city. But almost immediately they are beset by what was supposed to be a relief force for the defenders. So the Crusaders find themselves defending the walls of the city they had just a few days before been attacking. And abandoned by their allies, starving, exhausted, dying of disease, all hope for the Crusaders is completely gone. And they know this! But then... One of the religious leaders of the Crusades, a man named Peter the Hermit, is told in a dream to dig up the floorboards of the Church of Antioch. So he does this the next morning, and lo and behold, he finds the Holy Spear of Christ. After Jesus was crucified, the Roman soldiers stabbed him to make sure he was dead. Because according to some accounts, if somebody survived a crucifixion, then the Roman guards were they themselves crucified to pay for their mistake. Anyway, this spear became known as the Holy Spear of Christ. And according to some Christian traditions, but especially during the medieval era, this was an invaluable Christian relic. And the Crusaders had supposedly just found it. It was presented to the starving, diseased, walking skeletons of men who called themselves Crusaders, and it absolutely invigorated them with a passion and a fervor that should not have been possible. 
And so, with all hope dashed apart, the Holy Spirit inspired them to ride out and to meet the enemy in a charge. And they did this. And again, against all odds, they somehow won. And the first crusade was saved. So going back, we were talking about this in class, and my friend and I were arguing. He, being a devout Catholic, was arguing that this spear was indeed the Holy Spear of Christ. And me, being skeptical and being a jerk who wanted to ruin his fun, was arguing that there was no way this was the actual spear. And after a few years, a few years, no, 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 after a few minutes of this, my professor interrupted and said, guys, it doesn't matter. It doesn't actually matter whether or not this was the Holy Spirit of Christ. What matters is that they believed it was. It's the reaction of the Crusaders that make this story as important to history as it is. Well, this shut both of us up. And in this age of skepticism, I think we so often dismiss these religious or cultural stories as mere unimportant myths or legends. And again, I'm not saying any religion is wrong or any religious is right. I'm not going to tell you what I believe. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is remembering that belief is a power, a huge power, a power that can change humans and can change history and can certainly change a battle. So returning back to Timur, was he visited in a dream and told that God favored him and would grant him victory? I have my doubts, sure, and maybe you do too, but it doesn't matter because the next morning Timur tells Hussein about his dream and then they tell their whole army and their whole army believes that this was true. And I forget what historian or general said this, but they said something along the lines of military is a science to some degree. We can study the weapons and the geography and the psychology of warfare, and using that data we can make predictions and calculations, but the belief of men in battle is a total wild card that's nearly impossible to put numbers to. And this wild card can change the outcome of entire empires. So the next morning, as both sides lined for battle, Timur and Hussein's men were fueled with a passion, a fire of determination that the Mughals simply had no answer for. As Yazdi sums up, And the soldiers, whom the present danger had rendered fearful, grew dauntless as soon as it was made known to them. This ensuing battle is referred to as the Battle of Kaaba Matan. Timur and Hussein split their army into two wings, with Hussein leading the right flank and Timur the left. And we're told that combat begin with the Mughals sending some, uh, some skirmishers forward to test the strength of Timur's flank. And this advance was met with a rain of arrows from Timur's soldiers. And as Yazdi ominously writes, there was not one who advanced that returned. Now again, I know we haven't talked much at all about the steppe tactics and warfare. We will, don't worry. But for now, just know as most of these troops were mounted archers, much of this style of warfare revolved around hitting the enemy from afar while avoiding hand-to-hand -hand combat as much as possible. And knowing that the Mughals far out outnumbered them, Timur and Hussein knew that prolonged missile fire would be something they just couldn't answer. Thus, we're told that after this brief skirmish, before the Mughals could decide their next move, Timur and Hussein charged their army into the respective sides of the Mughal army. And not expecting this unorthodox style of warfare, the Mughals were caught completely off guard and the side facing Timur's charge just crumbled into chaos. This allowed Timur to wheel some of his men around and attack the flank of the Mughals that were engaged with Hussein's portion of the army. And although the Mughals were able to hold their ground here for some time, they were now mostly surrounded, and the passion and fervor of Timur and Hussein's men was too much. The Mughals fled. And the horsemen of Timur and Hussein, Hussein pursued them, cutting down and feeling, feeling and learning how to speak English. They were cutting them down and filling with arrows anybody unlucky enough to fall behind. Meanwhile, Timur ordered a detachment under two of his most trusted officers to ride directly for the city of Samarkand. Samarkand was the most fortified and powerful city in Transoxiana. Controlling the city meant controlling most of the region. So the men did this, and the civilians threw open the gates in celebration and welcomed the liberators. Now this is where the story breaks down into a few hazy theories. We're used to this at this point, right? There are always 17 differing accounts of what happened with Timur, and here's yet another case of this. So I came across three accounts of what moguls were captured after this battle and what happened to them. Here are these three accounts. 
The first account says that my upstairs neighbor is going to spend 35 minutes blending some sort of giant smoothie. But it also says that Ilyas himself, the leader of the moguls here in Transoxiana, along with his second-in-command officer, Bikajek, and many other officers were all captured. Then when they were brought before Timur and Hussein, Timur, in a great act of mercy, gave them horses and allowed them to go home. This I find nearly impossible to believe. Letting the moguls go would be, well, stupid. They still have their whole land of Mogulistan to the east. They could easily muster a new army and be back next spring. However, we do get a nice story from this, ver from this, this account. According to this account, the moguls are brought before Timur, and Timur asks them, what do, you wish to, what do you wish me to do with your lives? And their response, according to Timur's memoirs, is this. We are indifferent whether you kill us or not, for on the day that we put on our armor and braced on our swords, we considered our blood as shed and our bodies decapitated. I, I love this response, and apparently Timur did too, because he let them go. Again, I find this story the least likely, but it is one account that we're given. The second account is that Ilyas and Bikajak and the other officers were captured, but instead of being brought before Timur and Hussein, some of Timur's men felt pity, or maybe a secret allegiance to the Mughals. So they gave these officers their horses and let them flee instead of turning them over to Timur and Hussein. Another slightly different version is that the Mughal leaders managed to escape in the chaos of the end of the battle. Either way, this I find more believable. As we've seen, and we will see, the loyalties of these armies differed greatly from man to man and from tribe to tribe. Or maybe in the chaos of the slaughter after the battle, as men are being cut down or tortured, and bodies looted, and amidst the screaming of the wounded, many of the moguls do manage to escape, and maybe this included the mogul leaders. But the third theory is what I, and several more recent historians, find the most compelling. If we back up a few days before this battle, several Mughal messengers arrived to Ilyas Hoja with urgent news. His father, the great Tughluq Timur Khan, ruler of the renewed Chagatai Khanate, is dead. Maybe it was a fever, maybe a battle, but the Khan is dead. And if Ilyas wants to make sure that he inherits his father's position, he has to act, and he has to act now. This means that he needs to haul himself back to Magulistan before any other rival speaks up or any civil war breaks out. Thus, perhaps Ilyas wasn't present for the battle at all, but was instead racing back home to Magulistan in order to secure his throne as Khan. We know he does go back there eventually, and we know that his dad died right about this time, so this actually makes a great deal of sense. Ilyas Hoja, now Ilyas Khan, races back to Mughalistan and leaves his second-in-command, Bikajek, to take care of Timur and Hussein. Whatever the actual case, Timur and Hussein were victorious. The Mughals were fleeing Transoxiana, and Ilyas Hoja was back in Mughalistan trying to secure his position as Khan. But Timur and Hussein had done it. They were victorious. After years of trials and loss, they had somehow won. Transoxiana, the land between the rivers, Mawarinar, it was theirs. And we're told that Timur and Hussein march into Samarkand amid the shouts and cheers of the population. Only a few years before, Timur had been marched through these gates as a captive, given over to the wrath of his uncle, but now Timur was here as a conqueror, a liberator, and even a hero. Now, here again, we get those differing opinions. Timur's autobiography tells us that Timur becomes the leader of Transoxiana. And meanwhile, Hussein is just kind of a, a second in command, maybe. Our more reliable sources tell us that Timur and Hussein ruled jointly, but several modern historians think that it was Timur who was the second in command. After all, Timur didn't have the name or the birthright. Hussein did. Hussein's grandfather was Amir Kazagan. He was a descendant of Amirs and ruler of his own kingdom of Kabul, and he had experience doing this whole ruling thing. Timur was no doubt the sole ruler of Kesh and of the Barlas tribe, and certainly a figure of immense importance, but probably not Amir. 
In fact, Beatrice Manns says that Timur may not have even been the second most powerful guy, but maybe a, a few rungs down the, the society the society ladder. <laughs> what am I saying? You get, you get what I'm saying, okay? So most likely, considering this all, what I find most likely is that Hussein was made Amir, the sole leader of Transoxiana, while, um, while Timur remained one of the more influential and important leaders under Hussein. Very possibly, Timur was Hussein's second-in-command and right-hand man. They were brothers-in-law, allies, and friends after all, but Timur was not Amir. Now, there was also another role that needed to be filled. Ever since the days of Genghis Khan, the peoples of his former empire very often only accepted a descendant of Genghis Khan as their rightful leader. That's how much of a, a godlike legacy Genghis Khan had. Only people of his blood were deemed good enough to follow. And unfortunately for both Hussein and Timur, neither was a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. Thankfully though, Hussein's grandfather Amir Kazagan, who had ruled years before, he had come up with a little remedy for this. You simply find a descendant of Genghis Khan, announce him as Khan and rightful heir, and then strip him of all power and reduce him to a puppet, a puppet Khan. So this is exactly what Hussein and Timur do. They find a man, a great-grandson of Dua, if you remember Dua from our episode on the Chag Chagatai Khanate, and therefore this guy is a descendant of Genghis Khan, albeit way back. But this man was a man named Kabul Shah, and he was brought to Samarkand, clothed in expensive robes, put on a throne, everybody bowed before him nine times, as was custom, and then as historian René Grousset so wonderfully sums up, after which they paid him no more attention. But this will be a pattern for Timur. He will always have a puppet Khan ruling in his name, and he'll actually go through a few of them, but we'll get to that later. But anyways, victory was here. A new Khan had been named, and great celebration broke out across the city. There were great feasts, and Timur and Hussein rewarded their soldiers and the families of those who had fallen. The fate of certain Mughal prisoners was also decided. Some were executed, some were spared, depending on just, just who they were, and some were handed over to various subjects who had particular feuds with them so that they could decide the fate. And these instances typically ended badly for the captured moguls, as you can expect. Anyway, after several days of celebration and putting everything into order, Timur traveled back to his home city of Kesh and Hussein back to the south, even though he was still ruler of this whole land. This was a time of joy and victory for Timur and Hussein and for their people. As Yazdi finishes this chapter in the Zafarnama, he says, our princes stayed at their respective homes all the winter. Their affairs were in so good a condition that they could not at all that time desire more prosperity than they enjoyed. But then, with the very first line of the next chapter, Yazdi begins with, This prosperity did not last long. Because during the winter of 1364 through 1365, Ilyas Khan had not sat by idly. He had raced back to Mughalistan, crushed all opposition, and secured his title of Khan and true son to his father's legacy. And as his father had done twice before, Ilyas Khan was not going to let Transoxiana revel in its independence. This land was rightfully his. The Chagatai Khanate had to be reestablished, and it was his right as Chagatai Khan to do this. Thus, in the spring of 1365, the Mughals launched a third invasion of Transoxiana, sweeping the past the borders with the aim to crush this pesky independence movement once and for all, and that meant defeating Timur and Hussein. And I almost ended this episode here, but decided not to because the story is just way too interesting, and there's a, there's a better cliffhanger coming up, so we'll leave it there. Anyway, so knowing that the Mughals were on their way, Amir, Hussein, and Timur gathered their forces together to meet the returning invaders. The armies drew up across from one another near Tashkent on the northern banks of the Sir Darya or Jakartes River, and this happened in May of 1365, and the battle is known to history as the Battle of the Rains, or the Battle of the Marsh. And before the fighting begins, a few things happen. First, we're told that as Timur and Hussein's forces are marching to the battleground, they're overcome with, shall we say, arrogance? Yazdi explains this with, 
Timur's soldiers were full of presumption and vanity because they once before conquered this very enemy. Things are looking good. We've beaten the Mughals before. We can do it again. There are probably soldiers in that army who have already fought us and lost. They're scared. We can do this. And then, and then it started to rain hard. Historian Harold Lamb has this great line that's along the lines of, Before the men began battle, the heavens began its own battle as lightning crashed upon lightning. Our sources blame mogul sorcery for the rain, specifically the powers of a magical stone that were called upon to call on this storm. But whatever the case, Timur and Hussein's men soon found themselves soaked to the bone and caught in this horrible storm. Whereas, as we're told, the Mughals had taken precautions. They had covered their horses, their bows and arrows in thick waterproof cloaks. They even dug trenches to guide the water away from their formations. Meanwhile, Timur and Hussein's men were drenched, their horses stuck in the mud, and their weapons pretty much rendered useless. You can't use a bow if it's soaked in water. And meanwhile, this storm is just raging overhead. Yazdi has yet another wonderful description. I love how he wrote, and he says, The world seemed ready to fall into its original chaos. And a bit later he says, The earth could no longer be distinguished from the sea. And amidst this watery chaos, the battle begins. Like before, Timur took command of the left flank and Hussein the right. And as Yazdi tells us, there was the most terrible slaughter that was ever known. Blood flowed in little rivers, and the dead bodies fell over one another, both friends and enemies, without knowing who were the conquerors. And during this battle, during the chaos, we're actually given this really interesting detail. So, with our pro-Timur sources, like Yazdi, we have to be careful because very often Timur is blown into this larger-than-life figure, right? But every once in a while, these pro-Timur sources will include a, a mistake made by Timur. And these are invaluable to us because pro-Timur authors describing a mistake or, or a human element of Timur have more credibility. Similarly, on the other hand, when anti-Timur sources give him compliments... Those are very valuable to us. We expect anti-Timur sources to just go on and on about how awful he was, but then when, when like Ahmed Arab Shah goes out of his way to tell us that Timur was absolutely brilliant with horses and could tell a good horse from a bad horse just by looking at it, well, we know that that's probably true. Why else would Arab Shah include it? And so with Yazdi, who is a very pro-Timur writer, and has absolutely no reason to include faults of Timur, well, when he includes a story in which Timur loses a fight and almost gets killed, why would he include that? We'll never know whether or not this actually happened or what Yazdi's intentions were, but I find this story pretty compelling. The story that Yazdi gives us is that in the middle of the battle, Timur is in the fray and he comes face to face with a Mughal officer who probably recognized him. And so the two captains begin dueling amid the chaos. And as the two men are dueling it out, neither one is able to gain the advantage over the other. But then finally, Timur swings his war axe down at the Mughal officers. Oh, officers. Officers. Not. Yeah. Oh man, wow, just, lo just lost everything there. Okay, we're going to re rewind. Timur swings his war axe down at the Mughal officer's skull. The officer deflects it with his shield though, and in return swings his saber around to strike Timur down. And Timur, being unbalanced by the deflection, would have been slain had not one of his soldiers driven a spear through the ribcage of the Mughal officer, which in turn saved Timur. And we're actually told that this soldier was of the Barlas tribe, of the same tribe as Timur. And, and you kind of have to think to yourself, did they know each other? Did they grow up to, with each other? Probably not, but there are so many fun things in history like that. But zooming out a bit, while Timur may have been momentarily spared, the battle was going poorly. Timur's flank had managed to hold its ground, but Hussein's flank was buckling under the Mughal onslaught. Seeing this, Timur gathered what men he could and reared back to reinforce Hussein. And this did push the Mughals back and it brought Timur and Hussein some time to breathe. Timur told Hussein that they must push forward with everything they've got. The victory is almost at hand. But Hussein said that their advance must be cautious just in case that there's a trap. 
And with this disagreement, Timur again returned to his detachment, and he attacked with everything he had. And as the battle continues to rage, as the sources tell us, Timur sees their opportunity to, for victory and sends a messenger to Hussein to tell Hussein quickly, attack now, throw in all of your reserves, this final push is everything. And when this messenger tells Hussein this, Hussein responds by punching the messenger, beating him, and exclaiming, Have I fled? Then why does he press me to advance? When the messenger returns to Timur and tells him Hussein's response, Timur then sends two new messengers, who were friends and possibly even relatives of Hussein, to say the same thing again. And Hussein responds by beating these guys up before sending them back to Timur. Timur is understandably infuriated by this and has to pull back his advance in order to avoid being cut off. And his autobiography has this great sentence that just sums up what his feelings probably were. The sentence just says, Amir Hussein behaved like a blockhead. I just love that. <laughs> anyway, as night fell, both sides disengaged, returning to their camps and began preparing for a second day of fighting. The next morning, the, the fighting resumes, and we're not given too many details on what happens, but it looks like Timur and Hussein fell for a classic feigned retreat. The feigned retreat is the most infamous tactic of the Mongols and of other medieval steppe peoples. Simply put, the Mongols pretend like they're retreating. Then, as the enemy gives chase and their formations disintegrate in this chaotic chase, the Mongols rear about, encircle the enemy, and charge into their confused and terrified foes who had just seconds before thought they had won. And the Mongols used this tactic a lot, with devastating effect, and from all we're given here, it looks like the Mongols used this same tactic now on Timur and Hussein. Very quickly, the princes were encircled, overwhelmed, and forced to retreat. Timur's autobiography assures us that, don't worry, Timur and Hussein were able to retreat in good order, and only about a thousand men were lost. But our other sources paint a very different picture. And also knowing how devastating a successful feigned retreat was, retreating in good order was not an option. Timur and Hussein's army disintegrated into chaos as the taste of victory transformed into the ashes of annihilation. Men threw down their weapons and fled in all directions, trampling over the dead and dying, trampling over one another in their frantic, animalistic attempt to flee danger. And we're given this horrifying scene of the Mughal archers easily shooting arrows into the backs of the fleeing men who then fell into the pools of rain and blood and drowned in this sludge of mud and corpses. Yazdi says that 10,000 men died in this swamp of arrows and doom. And amidst this stampede of nightmarish terror, Timur and Hussein were separated and were speedily fleeing to survive anywhere. This was the Battle of the Rains. Nothing now opposed the Mughals from sweeping back into Transoxiana, seizing Samarkand, and taking back the region. And once again, we find Timur fleeing for his life. His army, his allies, his hopes for rule had been crushed. This has been the Timur Podcast. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing this episode as much as I enjoyed writing it. With every passing weep, weep, there's a lot of weeping, but I meant to say with every passing week, I am more and more blown away with how captivating the story of Timur is, and it, it only gets more intense. We, we, we haven't even gotten to him becoming Amir yet. So anyway, if you want to reach out to me for any time and for any reason, feel free to email me at timurpodcast at gmail.com. I respond to all emails or messages, so just throwing that out there. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Podcast Timmer or uh, at Timmer at Timmer Pod. What does that even mean? What, when did I write this? I don't, I don't know. Or on Facebook at Timmer Pod. Also, if you're enjoying the show, a rating or review on whatever platform you're using really does help out. And for everybody who has left a review, thank you. It's really encouraging to see. Next week, we will see how Timmer and Hussein react to this defeat. Both men do survive the Battle of the Rains but they've pretty much lost everything. 
Also, I'm going to try and finish our second source episode, which is on Ahmad ibn Arab Shah. And he's one of our, if not the most anti-Timur sources. So that should be interesting. And hopefully I can get that out soon. But anyway, join me next time right here on the Timur Podcast. (laughs) 